Hello, everybody, and welcome back to The Advisor with Stacey Chalemi. And today I'm very excited because we have our special guest. She is part of our podcast community. She has her own podcast on our channel. So go. I want you to look for Marisol James. She is a best-selling author, and she is a romance author. And she has some outstanding stories, and they do very well. So as you can see, there's a lot of readers out there that love her spicy romance novels, including myself. So today we're going to talk about narcissism. And uh, Marisol wants to talk about the warning signs, what it's like to be in it at the moment, and also after you leave a narcissistic relationship, the things you have to go through, and some of the scenarios that you might have to deal with that you might not be aware of. So Marisol, thank you so much for coming to the, on the show today. I always love when you come, and I'm really excited to hear what you have to say about narcissism, because narcissism is a topic that a lot of people go through in relationships, mothers, fathers, you know, and, and many different instances, but for, you know, what, um, you have gone through a narcissistic relationship. So you have, have a lot of experience in this field. What can you tell us about narcissism and, you know, some of the topics that we just, you know, mentioned? Mm. Hey, Stacy, <laughs> it's good to see you again. <laughs> Thanks for having me. You're welcome. <laughs> Thanks for having me again. Um, yeah, unfortunately, uh, I did, have a narcissistic relationship. Uh, I'm afraid that it's something that was probably one of the hardest experiences of my life, just because of the emotional and psychological abuse, yeah. more so than the physical, oddly enough. But what I have found since leaving, I left about a year and a bit ago, now I ended things and, and moved on with my life, is that the physical part has mostly healed, mm -hmm. although my right shoulder is permanently damaged for the rest of my life. But what I've really had to work on is all of the emotional and psychological almost triggers in myself that um, to this day, like just today, I was talking to somebody about something and I responded in a certain way. And then I caught myself and I realized, no, that's not, that's not what I think. That's his voice in my head telling me something. That's not who I am. It's who he said I was. Yes. And I caught myself, I apologized. And we, the, the conversation picked up from there. But that is the thing about being in a relationship with a narcissist. And I can only comment about um, a romantic relationship because I, he was my first narcissist. I, yeah. I had never met one before him. So I was utterly, utterly unprepared for the reality of what the narcissist is like. I didn't know what to look for. I didn't know any of the warning signs. Once I was in the relationship, I didn't know that's what it was. I knew something was very wrong, but I couldn't name it yes. until probably six months before I finally ended it. And it was a six-year relationship. So I'm, I'm no dummy. I'm not an unintelligent woman, yeah. but I was completely unprepared for the reality of the narcissist, which is what I wanted to talk to you about today a bit. I'd like to give some people um, some of the warning signs that I utterly missed. And yeah, I, and I think that's great that we do talk about the warning signs because I was in a narcissistic relationship and I did not know that the person was a narcissist. I didn't, wasn't even sure what a narcissist mm -hmm. was until I started to do research. And then I realized that they had all the symptoms, anything, you know, everything mm -hmm. that they talked about, about a narcissist, that person was. And, mm -hmm. you know, then I started to do more research and start to learn about it. And then I started to go on different sites like Psychology Now and, and learn about why they do the things they do and what is behind it. And, and it's a disorder. It's a disorder. Yeah. And it could even lead back to the environment they grew up or the trauma they had to experience. And they have very low self-esteem. But when you're in a relationship like what are the warning signs? Tell people, you know, because I, for years, I didn't realize that person was a narcissist. And once I understood that they were a narcissist, I was able to um, deal with it better. And I mm -hmm. got myself out of the relationship, but I understood what was going on and I understood why the person was the person they were and mm -hmm. what was the best choices for me. So for you, what were the warning signs? Mm. Well, it's interesting that you, you use the word disorder because it, it actually is. It's actually a personality disorder. Yeah. And it's something that 
it can't ever actually be cured in the person. Right. But if, if they're made aware of it and they have any self-awareness and accountability, which narcissists generally don't, but yes. it, it is possible for a narcissist to recognize they are a narcissist and to go for treatment for it. Yes. But that I don't think happens hardly. I can think of one narcissist on social media who has um, an Instagram account and does workshops, podcasts, seminars, education as a narcissist, seven years in psychotherapy, seven years. Wow. And he says, he says that he still reacts in the narcissistic way. His first thought and reaction and word is always narcissistic. But what seven years of intense therapy has taught him is to stop and say the second thing or go with the second thought or act in the second way. So to be a narcissist, I think, is permanent. It can be managed, but it requires a whole lot of humility and accountability and responsibility, which is not what narcissists are known for. So, I mean, I think there's this idea you and I were talking before we started this podcast, we we're talking about how so many people don't even really know what narcissism is. And yeah. there's kind of this idea that if you're self-absorbed, you're a narcissist. Mm -hmm. Well, we're all self-absorbed in one way or another. To mm -hmm. be self-absorbed is to be self-interested. Yes. And to be self-interested is important. It, it allows us to improve ourselves. Yes. It allows us to take care of our hygiene. Yes. It allows us to push for that promotion at work or do better at school. Like if we're interested in ourselves, yeah. then we push ourselves. Yes. So being self-absorbed isn't the defining characteristic of a narcissist. Yeah. I would personally say the defining characteristic of the narcissist is a complete lack of accountability or truth telling. Yeah. And that is, is you see that in a lot of different ways with the narcissist, but yeah. at their core, they are people who cannot ever take accountability or responsibility because they are so weak and, and um, so full of self-loathing. They yes. can't stand themselves yes. that if they were to admit okay, I shouldn't have done that. Okay, I, that was, I, I was horrible. I did the wrong thing. It means that they are a piece of crap in their mind. This is mm -hmm. what happens. Right. It goes from they do the wrong thing, they get called for doing the wrong thing. Rather than saying they did the wrong thing, they will deny and deny and deny and deny and deny. Because to admit they did the wrong thing is to feed into that absolute self-loathing and that weakness and that inability to um, do the right thing because they're strong enough to do the right thing. Right. So if we're talking about narcissism, it's not being self-absorbed, which can be quite healthy. It's about the absolute lack of accountability or responsibility. Mm -hmm. And that's where it begins. And then how they avoid that accountability and responsibility yes. takes on many faces and strategies and facets. And this is where we see the same behaviors over and over. So it's almost like there's a narcissist's playbook <laughs> or a <Yes>. workbook mm -hmm. <clears throat> because they all behave the same way. I mean, yeah. if, you, if you speak to other women, in my case, I speak to women who have been in narcissistic relationships or, or still are. And I say, oh, yeah, and then he did this. It's like, they, they, they just go, oh, my God, you know, oh, my God, he does that too. Oh, my God, he never yeah. stopped. Why does he do that? And it's like, it all comes back to anything to avoid accountability, or really looking at themselves, anything to avoid the shame of really admitting who they are at their core, yes. anything to avoid that. And then it looks a few different ways, which is when we talk about the, the patterns of behavior. Yes. Um, but it, at its core, a narcissistic personality is somebody who is so full of self-loathing and shame, and they will do anything to face that and admit that, including manipulation, deflection, lying, gaslighting, 
um, turning themselves into the victim, turning turning you into the aggressor, um, you know, stonewalling, using the silent treatment, getting abusive, rage episodes, like anything, anything, anything to yeah. throw you off, continuing to try to hold them accountable for something they did or said. Yeah. And all of these little um, tactics they use, they, they all use them. <laughs> and anybody who's been in a narcissistic relationship will recognize what I'm talking about. Yeah. So that though these are some of the things to look for is these um, lack of accountability behaviors, the ways to distract or confuse or muddy or muddle anything to avoid having to say, put their hand up and go, yeah, I was, I was a real dick. I shouldn't have done that. That was really <laughs> wrong with me. Anything to avoid saying that yes. anything from, denying they did it to hitting you until you shut up about it and there's everything in between everything and i've experienced both ends and everything in between and i think most women in narcissistic relationships with romantic partners will have experienced some spectrum of it definitely i i still have several people in in my circle that i know <laughs> that are narcissists and unfortunately they those are the people that you really can't get out of your life you know and uh and, you know, and so I had joined a, a forum, a group, you know, and it was, it wasn't just, it was, it was uh, well-educated individuals who were, was, were in, in narcissistic relationships and just helping one another. And everything that every single person said, every symptom was exactly something that I could relate to because mm -hmm. you have to walk on eggshells around these individuals, these oh, people. God, yeah. These people all have self-esteem that is paper thin and they will always be in denial. And you'll never, I don't think, I have never seen a narcissist where they have said the word, I'm sorry, or I understand where I was wrong. Let's, you know, let's make amends. You know, they will, they will turn it around. Or if they do partially, they will be a loophole. They will be you mm. know, to make it like you are also responsible, but they won't take yeah. the responsibility for the for the situation, even though the other person may have not done anything to transpire the situation. They will still try to guilt you or loophole you or do what lawyers do and, and switch the conversation and make it seem like, it, you know, all of a sudden you're the person who's the bad guy and not them, you know, so mm -hmm. it is it is a it's a very difficult disorder, but it, they, you, you know, when you have a group of people that have a narcissistic in, person in their life, everybody mm -hmm. will be like, when you talk about the warning signs, they're like, oh, I've experienced that too. Oh, I've yeah. experienced that too. Because it's all the common same symptoms over and over and over again. It's so true. Let's say it's the same behaviors. I mean, yes. it's, it's like I said, the source is the same, which is this, this deep, loathing and inability to take responsibility and also to deal with the shame of their own behavior. They can't deal with the shame. So they will do everything they can to make sure that they don't have to deal with it. And the yeah. easiest way is to throw it on somebody else. Exactly. And that, and that is where you see the same behaviors, the same patterns of speech, yeah. the same um, methods over and over. And this is why you think there's a narcissistic playbook, but it's just the human playbook. Like if I do something really wrong to someone yeah. and I feel awful about it and I don't want to take responsibility for it, yes. well, the easiest things to do are to deny that I did it, mm -hmm. pretend that it didn't happen, yes. try to dress it up with some other excuse or some other, you know, some reason why it happened. Yes. And the best one of all, explain to you how it's your fault that I did what I did. Right. These are the, I mean, it's, it's so obvious once you start to see it. The problem is when you're in the relationship with the narcissist is they didn't start off being this person. They, they have enough self-awareness to know that they have to suck you in. They have yeah. to pull you in because, like I said, they are so full of self-loathing 
mm-hmm. and and they're weak people who can't stand on their own. So what they need is they need to be admired. They need to be loved. They need to be told how wonderful they are. Yes. They need to get all of that attention. And it has to be positive attention. Mm-hmm. Well, how do you suck someone into that sort of relationship? Well, you're their dream partner, aren't you? Mm-hmm. Like you, you, they have to get you to fall in love with them. This yeah. is really absolutely crucial for the narcissist is you have to fall in love with them. You have to become a source of admiration and mm-hmm. um, positive reinforcement because they don't have any for themselves. They have to get it externally. Yes. So that's what they do. That's why they spend the first little while in the relationship being the absolute dream, perfect, idealized partner. And that's why they spend so much time in the beginning getting you to be vulnerable and getting you to open up is because they need to know what you need. Like they need to know how you were wronged in past relationships. So they'll tell you why they're not that person or Mm -hmm. they need to know what happened in your last relationship where you cheated on, like what happened. Well, then they'll go out of their way to be the exact opposite from yes. that previous relationship because right. you are going to think oh my god this person is so perfect mm-hmm. and what you don't realize you don't realize because most of us don't operate this way yeah most of us don't talk to potential new partners about vulnerabilities and painful experiences because we're collecting data to use against them later yes. no 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 most of us find these things out because we want to be respectful to our partner. We want to build trust. We want to build connection. We want to know that they can be vulnerable with us and be safe. And Mm -hmm. this goes both ways. Yes. So with the narcissist, all you're doing is handing them ammunition. You're handing them every secret to your life about what scares you, what hurts you, what makes you feel insecure. Mm -hmm. And all they give you in return is a whole lot of reassurance that they are not that person for you. You, They they are the best person. And so I would say one of the earliest signs that you're with somebody who's not a safe person is that they really go from zero to 90 like that. Like you are so connected to them so quickly because they are making you fall in love with them. But Mm -hmm. you have to take a step back and say, do I really know them? Or is it more that everything I say, they tennis lob back at me? Like if I say, oh, you know, I really, my ex-boyfriend didn't want to get married and have kids. Suddenly the narcissist is just like, well, it's my dream to get married and have two children and have the big house. And if you say, I never want to get married, my ex really wanted to push me into this, but I'm such a career girl. The narcissist will say, I so respect a woman who has her own independence and her own money and her own life. And my ex was really like clingy and needy and I need. So what happens is whatever you say, whatever you say, they are 190% on board. Mm-hmm. And that, does, that doesn't make any sense because no. nobody is 100% aligned with anybody else yes. ever. Yes. So the narcissist will tell you everything that you want and desperately need to hear to make you fall in love with them. Right. And it's a tactic. They don't mean any of it. So the problem is from the get-go, and this is devastating to realize, yeah. is that you've fallen in with love with somebody who doesn't exist. Yeah. They're not real. And it's devastating the day you look up and you realize that, which I did. It took yeah. me years. But they spend so much time building up this persona and wearing this mask and being this person and you fall so in love with them. And um, then, you know, and you tell everybody about them, oh, oh, you're, oh God, he's so perfect. Everything I want, he wants to, and he's so different from X, the X, the so-and-so. And your friends are happy for you because it's faded and it's meant to be in the stars of all aligned. Um, and then they get you, they sort of get you where they want you. You know, you move in with them or you get engaged or in some cases you get married and have children. But at some point, the, nar- the narcissist has to unmask because they can't, they can't 
maintain this act forever. Yeah. So at some point, the mask starts to slip. Yeah. And it can take months, it can take years. Um, but you start to feel like something's very wrong in this mm-hmm. relationship. You start mm-hmm. to realize that, you know, somehow everything is always your fault. It doesn't matter what you try to bring to their attention or what you try to talk to them about or or if they behave a certain way and you go to them as your partner and you say, listen, yeah. can we talk about this thing that happened? There's no um, accountability. There's that word again. And suddenly one day you sort of think to yourself, how can everything always be my fault? Like, how can it always, why am I always the crappy partner? Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, why am I always the one who yeah. dropped the ball or screwed up like that doesn't sound right how can it be that he did this thing but I ended up apologizing yeah and it's and it's because this person was so perfect and so amazing and so great that you start to feel like if there are problems in this relationship it's got to be me yes it's got to be me Mm -hmm. because he's so amazing right Right. so clearly I'm the issue here and then that's where the turn begins that's where the devaluation stage begins because you have gone from being perfect amazing exactly everything they want to you know what you're causing problems in this relationship like why are you why are you always picking on me Mm -hmm. why nothing I do is ever good enough um why are you always living in the past like you brought this up last week why are you bringing it up again well because we didn't resolve it last yeah. week well mm-hmm. why no we're having such a good day why are you trying why do you have to ruin everything so then this these are the types of conversations they start to say or these are the things they begin to say and you start to think you know what like why why am I bringing it up again like why yeah. what is my problem and you right. can't put your finger on it you can't mm-hmm. and then at some point there's going to be some kind of narcissistic injury that you right. inflict on them. And in my case, it was mostly because I stopped, I started really pushing things. Like I realized, no, I can't always be the screw up here. Like, yes. no, I didn't do it. He did it. And right. I have the right to tell him, well, I mean, <laughs> big, big mistake with a narcissist because yeah. again, you're forcing them to look at that part of themselves mm. that they don't like. Yes, you're start. You're starting to see behind the mask, and yes. they know you're starting to see behind the mask, and we can't have that. So, mm-hmm. they've got to whip it around quick as possible back on you. And this is where the walking on eggshells, as you mentioned, starts to happen. And this yeah. is where um, the personal attacks start to happen. And this is where the rage happens. Where if you will not let it go, if you insist on pushing this wow, are you ever punished for it? Mm -hmm. And everyone's allowed to get angry. Like we're all entitled to anger. And sometimes anger is even very justified and required, but not when it's used as a weapon to shut you up from talking about something that is actually an issue in the relationship. Yes. And that is such a huge red flag with the narcissist is Mm -hmm if they feel that you're um, trying to get them to take accountability, oh my God, the rage. And it is, it's not anger. It is rage. And um, you sound like you've seen what I'm talking about. So I have. (laughs) And that's caused by a narcissistic injury where you, you force them to see something about themselves that they are desperate to not face and God, you're, you're punished for that. You're punished severely. So these are all kind of um, signs, although there are a million others, but these are sort of the, this, this is kind of the, the cycle. This, this is the evolution, or I should say the devolution of the relationship. It goes from being like the perfect, most amazing thing ever to, something that something's not quite right. So you ask a few questions to um, being terrified to open your mouth for the the punishment that you'll receive. And this is a long process. Like in my case, it took about two years before the, the amazing dream guy turned into the nightmare. Yeah. And this is, and two, this is two years. And in that time you've been conditioned mm-hmm. to 
not ask questions or not push yes. or not demand accountability because mm -hmm. you've realized that it's just, it's so dangerous to stand up for yourself or to say anything. And this is really where the emotional and psychological abuse really comes to the front because you yeah. start to censor yourself. You shut yourself up. You don't say things that you feel like you should say because you realize what will happen if you do. And this is where the narcissist really gains control and power is they teach us to shut ourselves up, yes. you know, and that's, that's the real danger time because then our sense of self, our sense of self-respect and our dignity and our integrity go out the window because we know we're not being honest with our partner, but mm -hmm. it's dangerous to be honest with our partner. Yes. So we stop that. So we start to tell ourselves lots because mm -hmm. that's where we can live with ourselves. Right. You know, we start to say stuff like, oh, he's just stressed. Oh, it was my fault. Oh, I am too clingy. Oh, you know, whatever we tell ourselves, whatever they tell us to tell ourselves, that's yes. what we start doing. And this is one, another one of the red flags. The red flags aren't just their behavior. Some red flags are our behavior. Like right. we stop we stop communicating honestly because it's not safe. Right. And if you can't communicate honestly with your partner, then you're not in a good relationship. But people yeah. don't think about that with a no. narcissist. Pe people talk about what they do. Right. Well, there's plenty that we do as well yes. that we need to recognize in ourselves. And yeah. these are also some big red flags is how our behavior changes yeah. to keep the peace. Yeah. And I, I have noticed myself that when you do, you have to shut up because you know that a lot of times they will, they will lash out and they will, they will lash out for the kill. They will become very mm. vindictive and they will do things that normal individuals wouldn't do to someone that they care about or love. And yeah. I, I, you know, I've seen many people in relationships just they they just keep quiet and all those emotions are repressed and repressed and repressed and then i've seen some people just go completely numb you know and and their emotions are just you know you know they will they will change when they're around people they actually have you know positive relations with but and then there are some people who lose the ability to do that because they're so numb. And then there are other individuals who just are so, um, they're, they're, they're just, uh, they become very depressed, you know, and, mm. uh, and then you have people who, you know, you know that you can't say anything because they will, they will want to hurt you, you know, in some way or fashion, they will figure out a way they want to see you, you don't, you're not going to agree with me. You're, 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 you know, talking against me. You're making me feel like this. Well, I'll show you. And then they go after you for the kill. And, mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, people like, you know, the victims are, are their emotions are repressed. They're scared. Their self-esteem, their self-worth goes downhill. And, you know, many people, if they can, um, that are in dysfunctional relationships, a lot of them came from dysfunctional relationships. So they only think they're worthy of what they're getting right now. So mm -hmm. they don't, they don't believe that they should come out of the relationship for you. You know, you did, when did you start realizing that these warning signs were, were serious and that you needed to actually get out of the relationship? Well, it's kind of interesting when you talk about sort of how people react, how the victims react to the narcissistic abuse. And you're right about all of them. And I would add, there's another reaction, which is the one that I found myself starting to do, which was my big warning sign, which was he would push me, like push and poke and prod, you know, because he knew every weakness, he knew every button in my life, emotional button, and he would start to push and push and push because he was looking for... Um, his own form of validation, which yes. was he realized that he really was a piece of garbage. Like on some level, they do know this. Yeah. And when you've been in the relationship long enough and they've started to wear you down 
And it reaches the point, like you say, where you stop reacting, you stop talking, you go numb, you just go into this world of make believe, like la la la, I'm not hearing a thing he's saying, yeah, whatever. Yeah. Um, they don't like they don't like that either. Because yeah. on the one hand, it's great because they don't get any pushback. Yeah. But on the on the other hand, they need some pushback because they like they like raging. They like throwing things. They right. like breaking things. They like shouting. They like going for the jugular. Yeah. But you don't give them any reason to do that, really, because you've yeah. gone so quiet. So what my ex would do is he would poke and poke and poke and poke and poke. And after about, I'm not joking, about two years, two years of being poked and poked and poked and me just not reacting or rising yes. the resentment builds up like my own anger built up my helplessness built up my you just start to feel like it's just one thing after another yes and one day you do snap like you do explode which is not my personality like it's not who I am in in my past relationships no matter what was said or done with my significant others I never got infuriated, like yeah. rage, ragey, infuriated, beyond reason, furious. Yes. And with, with him, I did. And so I would turn into an absolute lunatic mm -hmm. at a certain point because yeah. he would just push me that one little bit too far and I would detonate. Yeah. And then I was the one raging. I was the one throwing things. I was the one screaming at him. I was the one who was out of control. Right. And and then he would instantly turn it around like, um, wow, you're, you're out of control. You're so emotional. You're always telling me that I'm shouting and name calling. Like, look at you. Look at your behavior. Like, look how you're acting right now. Yeah. And that is a major, major tool in their arsenal or weapon in their arsenal because on the one hand I suddenly had to apologize to him yeah. because I was behaving like an insane person I was I was an absolute out of control lunatic well, you're, and he was everything right was repressed all your emotions exactly. were repressed I had snapped and frankly snapping like that is extremely healthy because when you've been ground down like that yeah to snap and stand up for yourself shouting and throwing things and hitting them and hitting him in the head or whatever, you know, that's actually, it's an inappropriate response, but it's a totally appropriate response because you can only take so much before you have to okay. react. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing is that then I was in the position of behaving the same way that he did. Yeah. All the ways I told him not to behave, I was doing it. So suddenly I'm just as bad as he is and yeah. I have to apologize. And secondly, there's this thing in you where you think, oh my God, what's happened to me? Like, how have I become this person? Like, what is wrong with me? He's right. Yeah. There's so much, I'm the problem here. Like I, you know, and you, you just start to think they're right. I am the problem. Yeah. So when they tell their parents or their friends or their coworkers, you don't know what I put up with. She loses her mind. She screams at me. She throws things he's not lying like right. this this is one of the reactions when you yeah. just can't take it anymore and you no. just explode so this is another reaction that doesn't get talked about nearly nearly enough yeah. it's called reactive abuse mm -hmm. in the nurse in the narcissist community where yeah. the, the narcissist pushes and pokes and prods until you react mm -hmm. and your reaction is not like you it's completely huge it's just as destructive as how they behave and it immediately puts you back in this position of feeling like you've done something wrong right you're just as bad as they are and then you're in the, you're in the shame spiral because yeah. you have behaved in a way that is not even remotely appropriate yeah you know and it's not like you and then you don't know who you are. You don't know what's wrong with you or what's happened to you. Or this, you know, and then you start to sort of think, like, who am I becoming? Like, yeah. what's happened to me? Yeah. And it was really interesting that after I broke up with him, 
um, he and I had a couple of, he went straight into therapy, interestingly enough, <laughs> in, in, in some attempt to convince me that he was going to be different. Yeah. And one of the most, I think probably what, one of the first honest things he ever told me, mm -hmm. which I found incredibly helpful, which I'm going to share with you and your listeners is I asked him about that. I said, listen, all those times you pushed me into exploding and then you turned it back on me. I said, did you do that on purpose? And he said, a hundred percent. This is so important for people to understand. He told me word for word. He said, I knew you were right. I knew I was wrong. I didn't want to admit it. I couldn't admit it. So I pushed you to react and behave exactly as I did. I dragged you down to my level. These were wow. his words. He said, I dragged you down to my level. So then you didn't have a leg to stand on when it came to my behavior. Because guess what? You were behaving the exact same way. I made sure of it. And I thought, that is so sick. You know, yeah. here I was fighting for my life, fighting for my life and my sanity. Yeah. And for him, it was a giant game because he couldn't admit that I was right and he was wrong. Right. He had he had to break me down to that level. And then, of course, I was in a position where I had to apologize to him, which he loved. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't say anything about his behavior because I had just behaved the exact same way. And he knew it. So don't ever think the narcissist doesn't know what he's doing because he does. No, he I really does. That. And again, it was because and he said it. He said it's because. He said, I realized you were right and I was wrong and I was not about to admit that. Yeah. So rather rather than saying, do you know what? You're right, I'm wrong. He made me go down to his level. It was a gigantic manipulation. Yeah. And um, that was when, it, after that happened, sort of the third time mm -hmm. that I engaged in the reactive abuse, Yes, I began to see it as the pattern. Like I began to understand that he was doing it on purpose mm -hmm. because as soon as I reacted that strongly, I was instantly in a shame spiral. I was very small, um, like emotionally. I felt just tiny. I felt so guilty. I felt so horrible. And he loved it. I could tell he loved it because, yeah. man, he had the upper hand all over again, didn't he? And by about the third time, I realized that he was getting off on it. It really served his purpose. And so it was after like, the third time that I looked at myself and I realized mm -hmm. that I, I was becoming somebody that I just didn't want to be and somebody who I essentially wasn't this person. Yeah. But in order to survive him, and mm -hmm. to coexist with him in this relationship, I had to become this person. Yes. I did. And um, I didn't want to be that person right. at all. And this is where I think if you're in a relationship with a narcissist for a really long time, you do become someone you don't recognize. It does oh, change you that much. A hundred percent. And that was when I realized that I, I needed to get out because um, I couldn't. I couldn't become this person full time. I mean, and I was becoming that person. Well, their behavior. There was no other way to survive you. it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 For sure. You were talking about that earlier. Yeah. Yeah. When you're in an environment and those people are doing negative things and they're they're doing negative things to other people, they're doing negative things to you. They've placed mm -hmm. a negative environment where you live in. You, un unconsciously you start picking up on their behaviors and not even realizing it, you might exemplify those behaviors to other individuals. And then once you get out of the relationship, then you start to mm. realize, wait, that wasn't right. I should never mm -hmm. have done those things. I should have never said mm -hmm. those things to so-and-so. But when you were in the environment, it just seemed like the norm until you mm -hmm. got yourself out of the environment. And I also, mm -hmm. you made a great comment, you know, there's two people that I, I, that are in my life that are narcissists and, you know, they blame it on their mental health. Well, how mm. are you so good at manipulation? If your mental health isn't a hundred percent there, 
or you're not all there. Well, you know, one was very good at manipulation when it came to therapists. They were able to con the therapist to make them look like the person who was the victim. And the other person knew just what to say to make others kind of believe that, you know, it, this wasn't just my, me, it was them, you know, and they would change things around. So they know how to manipulate, but manipulating is a skill. So it takes certain parts of the brain to be able to know how, like a puzzle, when you're putting a puzzle together, they take a little from here, they take a little from here, they know how to mix it together, and they know how to use it. And they're very good at it. So when you manipulate other people, and you can read other people, and then you know how to manipulate them, that's a skill. And Oh, it's not just all mental health. It's, it, you know, it goes beyond that. So you can't, if you see someone and you say, oh, that's, it looks like bipolar to me. Oh, you know, it's this. They're, they're not, they're not, you know, all the way out there. They're very aware of what they're doing and they know how to do it well. And, Yeah. Mm you -hmm. know, so, it, you know, manipulation, it's, you know, you can't always blame everything on mental health. When it comes to narcissism, they know how to manipulate. They, you know, that's why it's a disorder and not a disease. They know how to manipulate. They know how to con others. And that's a skill that takes intelligence. So if you look at someone and you don't think they're that intelligent, well, if they're a narcissist and they know how to manipulate well, they have a, a very high level of an intelligence because it's a skill that is a that is, is a learned skill and they know how to use it so it's successful. It's a hundred percent true. And the thing is that he would um he had this victim mentality. which is very powerful to use because um, if you, if you called him on anything, then you were just like all the other people who never believed in him. You're just like all the other people who tried to bring him down or attack him or all these other people that he did so much for that just didn't appreciate it and took advantage of him and used him. And this was his big thing in the beginning. Um, I was so appreciative and I was so wonderful and nobody had ever treated him so well. And then as time went on and I began to call him on things, suddenly I appreciated nothing, right? Right. Or I, I was just using him for money or sex or whatever, or, um, you know, he did all these things for me that I, I, I just didn't, I didn't appreciate enough. I, I'm just like, and then he would name two or three exes. Yeah. And I would think to myself, so weird how in the beginning I was nothing like these two or three women and suddenly now that I'm starting to push back on things I'm exactly like them like that's just that doesn't make a lot of sense to me right right but you mentioned you mentioned the therapists and one of the big things he and I never went to therapy um but I suspect and I I know I'm right he would have known how to portray things in a certain way that maybe we were both at fault, but definitely there would be part of it would be my fault, Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. but probably, and more importantly, the therapist would end up siding with him. And it's because he was so good at being the good guy to everybody else, the neighbors, the people he worked with, his family, you know, they all, it's like the flying monkeys. Every narcissist has to have his enablers Mm -hmm. Yes. and they can only have enablers and flying monkeys if they're a wonderful person to everybody but you. Yes. And it's a very powerful tool that they use because Mm -hmm. if you go to these people and try to say, that you're being abused and this is what happened. They'll stare, they'll just look at you like with him? No, not in a million years. Like I, he would never do that. And the other thing is that you, in the beginning, you told everybody what a great person he was, like perfect, your soulmate, the best person you ever met. And two years later, you're talking about what a rage monster he is because you ask him to pick up his socks. They don't believe you. They don't believe you. Mm -hmm. Because how did he go from being this person to this person in such a short period of time? And secondly, they've never seen person number two. Like, clearly, Mm -hmm. No. the problem is you. So without really realizing it, they reinforce the narcissists telling you 
yeah. that you're the problem. Mm -hmm. They reinforce your internalized belief that's constantly growing yeah. that you're the problem. And then they assure you that you're the problem. And a really smart narcissist will use a therapist in this way as well. So unless the therapist is actually really trained and on the lookout for narcissistic behavior, mm -hmm. they're not going to know what they're dealing with. But here's the thing is if the therapist is on to the narcissist, the narcissist will have nothing to do with that therapist, yeah. right? They'll, they'll opt out of there so fast because they'll be unmasked. Yes. They can't have that. And the second thing is I've, I've heard that um, like with my ex, he, after I broke up with him, he yeah. went straight to a therapist, immediately went straight to a therapist and then came to me and said, oh, my therapist says that I'm, I'm traumatized by this thing that happened to him a couple of years before I met him. Mm -hmm. um, and so suddenly he had this excuse therapist approved excuse <laughs> for why he was just so angry all the time. And he framed it as an anger management problem, which fair, he did have an anger problem with the rage and everything, but it's not like he had an anger problem because he had this trauma that he was upset about and hadn't processed. No, he had an anger problem because he was a narcissist who couldn't stand to be questioned. Yes. Those are not, those are not the same thing. Exactly. You know? Yes. Like if you've been traumatized and you're angry about it, because you haven't processed, that's one thing. But if you have an inbuilt self-loathing and fear of being exposed mm -hmm. and you cannot take accountability for anything in your life that's not trauma that's yeah. narcissism yeah. and what you do is you inflict trauma on others the trauma is not yours right <laughs> you know the trauma is everybody else's yes so but but they're very smart at taking just enough accountability i mean it's all false yeah. so it's it's no skin off their nose right but his whole thing about i have an anger problem well no you don't you have a narcissism problem Exactly. Not in a million years would he ever cop to that. But it was fine for him to say that I've been traumatized and I haven't processed the trauma because guess what? He's a victim again, mm -hmm. right? This horrible thing happened to him. And now yes. I have to be patient and understanding while he works through his trauma. Mm -hmm. And it's just one more, exactly. Like yeah. it's just one more way that they get to play the victim yes. and everybody else has to, um, go along with it, be understanding, be patient, shut up about it when they're acting out because they're traumatized. Yeah. And it just, it didn't work with me. You know, this, this all came out after I'd already broken up with him. And yeah. I think he, he, he was, he, he begged for a chance, got on his hands and knees, begged. And I said, no. Um, and that was kind of the end of that. But yeah, he, he was pulling out all the stops to, reel me back in right down to going to a therapist concocting a really great story convincing me that he was he was going to turn over a new leaf and be a new man and i know for a fact if i had said okay uh giving him another chance it his his behavior might have been fine for a couple of weeks and then we would have been right back mm -hmm. to where we were and the therapy would have stopped yeah. and all the rest of it there'd be no need to, to play the game because he got what he wanted, which was he exactly. got me right back where he wanted me to be. He was back firmly in control. And um, that, that didn't happen. So he went off and he found a new supply immediately, yes. like mm -hmm. within a couple of weeks, mm -hmm. you know, I, I was in healing for a year yeah. you know? and yeah. he was in a new relationship after a couple of weeks, but that's what, because he that's needed that. They, he needed that external validation. He needed mm -hmm. someone to admire him and adore him. I had stopped clearly. Yeah. So he needed to go find somebody else. And, right. and you know, whatever happened with me is happening with her. It's the yes. same patterns the over same and pattern. over and yes. over. Yeah. Because he's never going to do like what this man on Instagram who I told right. you about who's going into the psychotherapy for seven years my ex will never look at himself in the mirror and say I need to go get some serious help I need I need to really take some accountability for how my life is turning out yeah I can't get that 
from anybody else who I just fake like future fake into falling in love with me. I right. need to be honest about who I am. I don't think he'll ever do that. No. I don't see it. I don't see that either. And and you made a very good point. After the breakup, he went back and started trying to manipulate you. And that's what people have mm. to really not fall back into. Because I've seen that where they break up with a narcissist and the narcissist comes back and tries to manip manipulate them and try to hook them back into the relationship again. And then it's mm. a, a lot of people go back into the relationship and the abuse starts all over again and they go back to square one and they might be good for just a tiny bit of time. And then all of a sudden, boom, they're back into the same behavior again. So you know, before we go, like we talked about, mm. we talked about narcissism, we talked about the signs, we talked about the red flags, we talked about what it's like to be in the relationship. And, and after the relationship, after you leave it, you really have to stand your ground and not be manipulated to get back into the relationship. But one question I have for you is that, how did you get enough of courage? How did you get to that breaking point where you were like, enough is enough, I'm out of here? Mm. Like I said, it was after about the third time that I had this really extreme reaction to his abuse. Mm -hmm. And I was behaving in a way that I didn't know who I was. So that's when I you mean, were exploding then. I was, I, I was losing. I, I mean, I felt honestly, Stacey, I thought I was going crazy. Like I thought I was legitimately insane yeah. because I felt like I had no control over myself. Yeah. I felt like I had no control over my reactions, my thoughts, my feelings. I was crying in the shower every morning and every night. I was exhausted. Yeah. I I couldn't think about anything except how to not make him angry. I couldn't think about anything except if there was something I really wanted to talk to him about. I yeah. was approaching it like a court case. Like I was preparing for a trial where I yeah. had to approach it. I had to have my arguments. I had to have my proof. I had to have my evidence. I yes. had to have, you know what I mean? Yeah. And so I was spending all the time in my head preparing to talk to him about, please pick up your socks. Do you know what I mean? And then yeah. you start to realize that all you think about is how to navigate this relationship. Right. You don't think about anything else. And you really start to go insane. Like, I think I legitimately was crazy for a while yeah. there because mm -hmm. my brain, my brain was broken. Right. It wasn't working properly. So I, and then what's really hard is seeing a way out of it when your brain is that sort mm -hmm. of just broken down and you're yeah. just sort of broken as a person it's really hard to say I'm gonna go and yeah. then be able to plan it and be able to stick to it and then be able to carry it out and then when the love bombing starts and they're telling you how they need you they're gonna die without you they're going to therapy they see the error of their ways yeah. they cop to a few things you know what I mean yeah, it's really, really hard to in that broken state stick to your guns. So I think that's why people who are abused, go back so many times. Like yeah. in my case, I would break up with him or he would dump me and then we would make it up, you know? Yeah. And they do say I think the statistic is that an abused person will sort of leave a relationship seven times before they actually leave the relationship. And right. I never understood that until it was me yeah. because you're so damaged and exhausted and staying in the relationship is a huge mistake that exhausts you. Yeah. But leaving the relationship takes even more energy yeah. and then staying out of the relationship takes even more energy than that. Right. And you don't have any when yeah. you're an abused person. You right. don't have the strength and you don't have the foresight and you don't, you just don't, you can't see, you can't yeah. see it. You're so in it. You can't see it. Yeah. And so for me, the big thing, like I said, was I looked at myself in the mirror and honest to God, I had no idea who I was. I didn't right. even look like myself anymore. You know, yeah. I was just Beat up. so physically damaged and not physically damaged. I mean, I'm making it sound like my face was no, bruised. I know it wasn't. No. It was just like I, emotionally my expressions. beat up. Yeah. Yeah. Like my eyes, my mouth, my expressions, my skin, well, it was how I was carrying myself. Yeah. Yeah. 
and I looked like 15 years older than I do now. Like yeah. it just, it just, it wears on you. you. Yeah. And you look at yourself in the mirror one day and you're like, I don't even know who that is. Mm-hmm. And then you think about how you're behaving and you're thinking, I really don't know who that is. Right. Yeah. And I, I honestly can't tell you why this one time was the last time, yeah. but there was this one time that he was behaving the way that he had been behaving for years. Yeah. He was having a temper tantrum, like a toddler, because yeah. that's all a narcissist is. It's yeah. a, a, an adult with baby emotions that can't manage. And he was having another temper tantrum. And I just looked at him. And it was almost like an anthropologist observing human behavior from yep. like six or seven steps back. Yeah. And I felt nothing about it. But it wasn't like a numb like I'm beaten down and I can't feel it. It was just more like, I just don't give a crap. It was just, yeah. it was a different feeling of numbness. It, was, yeah, yeah. it wasn't, I didn't feel the need to reassure him. I didn't feel the need to manage his behavior. I didn't feel afraid of the outburst. Yeah. I didn't feel like I had to rush after he was done and smooth things over. I, I felt nothing. I just felt yeah. nothing. And I just looked at him and all I kept thinking over and over again was, this is going to be my life forever. Like this moment that I'm in now, yeah. that I've been in 8,000 times before now over the past four years, mm-hmm. this is my next four years. This is my next 24 years. Like, this is my life with this man. It's never going to get better. It's yeah. never going to change. It doesn't matter what I do or say. Mm-hmm. It doesn't, it doesn't, it's got nothing to do with me. This is him. Yeah. And it was like once I had those thoughts, like once I looked at him and I thought, this is it. <laughs> this is it. Yeah. You know? Um, this this is just this is it. Right. And then I thought to myself, I don't want this to be it. Like, yeah. I don't want this to be my life. Right. And as soon as you have that realization that this, this is nothing to do with you, yeah. this is really all about them. This isn't 50, 50, no matter what they say, this isn't even 80, 20, no matter yeah. what they say, this is 98 two. you yeah. know? Mm-hmm. Um, and your 2% is just, being in a normal relationship with anybody, there's always some slippage in terms of, you know, compromise or whatever discussions. Yes. Your 2% is generally healthy, you mm-hmm. know? Um, but, you know, this is, this is not me. And as soon as you sort of say to yourself, this isn't me, this has never been me and I deserve better than this. That is when you properly disengage this isn't one of the seven times before you leave this is the seventh time that you leave this is it and maybe you don't leave immediately like in my case it was months from the click moment to where I physically was able to go it took a lot of planning and time but after that moment it didn't matter what he said or did it didn't hurt me anymore yeah because I I had realized that I wasn't the problem And that is a really hard point to get to. Yeah. But once you do, it's, there's no, this isn't one of those times where you forgive them and take them back. Yeah. And um, everything slides back the way it was. You don't forgive them and take them back. You're already out the door. Maybe you're still there, but you're out the door. Um, And that, that is, that it takes time to get to that point and it's hard to get there. And I have so much empathy for people in relationships where, they're still in the moment of not getting it yet or yeah. worse, worse. They have gotten it and they can't, they can't get out yet because they're yeah. just not financially prepared. They've nowhere to go. Mm-hmm. If there are children that now there's a custody battle, like, you know what I mean? There's, yeah. it, it's a long, it's a long road, but that moment where you realize that this is your life, unless you change it, is such a powerful moment. Yeah. And once you've had that realization, you cannot put the blindfold back on. You can't pretend. You can't lie to yourself. You can't downplay it. You can't um, sort of convince yourself that everything will be fine. You just, you just, you know, you know in your bones and in your cells. Yeah. And once that knowledge is in your body like that, like in your yeah. cellular level, Mm-hmm. There's no, there's no going back. There's no changing it. 
it's, mm-hmm. it's done. Yeah. yeah. When, if you had to take today's discussion and you wanted to emphasize on some important factors, what would be some of the things that you'd like to emphasize on today's conversation to the listeners? I think the first thing I would say is what I said in the very beginning, which is that at their core, the narcissist is a weak, self-loathing, emotionally mature um, person right. who cannot look at themselves without shame and so will never take accountability or responsibility. Mm-hmm. That is who they are. That is narcissism at its yeah. core. And then all of these behaviors that we talk about yeah. are, are their coping mechanisms so that they don't have to take accountability or responsibility. Right. And as soon as somebody realizes that, that the reason he does this or says this or the gaslighting yeah. is because he's desperate to not have to look at himself. Mm-hmm. He's desperate to avoid the shame. Yeah. That is a huge realization. So I would just point that out to your listeners that all of these things we see externally, all the behaviors yeah. are a desperate, pathetic attempt to not take accountability. So all of these behaviors that are so destructive, yeah, they serve a purpose for the narcissist. Um, and the second thing I would say about today is that <sighs> Nothing you do or say with the narcissist is going to make things better. Right. Nothing. Because even like after a while, I stopped talking. I stopped bringing things up. I stopped engaging because it wasn't safe. Well, after a while, that made him angry too, because he would say something and I wouldn't respond. Yeah. And then he would be like, he would say something else and I wouldn't respond. And then he would say, oh my God, you just don't care, do you? Yeah. It doesn't matter. You just don't care. And then he was enraged about that. So the thing I would tell people is it's got nothing to do with you. It doesn't matter what you say or do, what you don't say or do, if you agree with them, if you don't, if you fight back, if you don't, if you walk on eggshells, if you don't, if you show them screenshots and evidence and proof, if you don't, it doesn't matter because it's got nothing to do with you, nothing. And you've got to get to the point where you don't just realize that you fully believe that Yeah. you, you, you know, it in your cells, that this is not anything to do with you because if you can get to that point where you really see it, then you are on the first step to getting yourself free of this really destructive, destructive, demoralizing relationship. And just know that the second you walk out that door, they're already scanning around for their next victim because they're predators. Yeah. And if they don't have you there giving them what they need, you know, filling up that space inside of them, mm-hmm. they're going to go find somebody else. So be prepared for that. Like you're going to be replaced pretty much immediately because yeah. a narcissist cannot be alone. They cannot. They need that admiration from other people. Yeah. So I would say those three things. First, really know what a narcissist is and what the behaviors actually do. Secondly, understand that nothing you do is going to change. Yeah. Because you can't, the problem isn't their behavior. Their prob- the problem is their core. And yeah. the third thing to realize is once you get out, it's hard to get out. And once you do, you're going to be devastated yeah. and You've got a lot of work to do, but they are going to happily skip on <laughs> to the next victim and you're going to be the one devastated and mm-hmm. wondering well, what on earth, how do I, what do I do now? Yeah. And they're going to be happily sucking admiration out of a new supply to yeah. fill that thing in them that they cannot cope with. Right. So you need, you need to realize that as well about the narcissist is once you walk away, they are going to have a new supply like that yes mine mine did Mm -hmm. mine did within a couple of weeks six-year relationship with me I was devastated for a year afterwards working on myself getting myself back and he's engaged you know I broke up with him in sort of August they had moved in before Christmas and they were engaged by the spring so exactly um so they will replace you because they need that yeah. supply. Yeah, for sure. So don't take that as any reflection on 
you, anything being wrong with you, there's something wow. very, very wrong with them. Something is very wrong with them. I suppose that's how I would sum everything up with a narcissist. Something is very wrong with them. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> now tell me about your books because, you know, you've written so many it's a series of romantic um, novels. They're all best selling. You're doing fabulous. Mm -hmm. Tell tell our listeners a little about your books and where they can find them. Well, my books are contemporary romance. So everything's very modern in the here and now. And they're modern problems and situations and issues. So what I get told by, from my readers is that they recognize themselves their significant others, their friends, their sisters in my books. So I think I write in a way that people actually do recognize themselves when they start to read um, my series. The thing about my characters is everybody's coming in from a different place with different baggage and situations. And I just love to put two people together who maybe don't necessarily work on paper, yeah. but because they are capable of being vulnerable and open and honest, and they can put the baggage down in front of this other person yeah. and they can have really open communication and honesty between them. And they're both vulnerable. There's give and take, and they're extremely you know, a healthy, the opposite of a narcissist. They're very healthy relationships. Yeah. And there are obstacles and there are compromises and there are misunderstandings and there are arguments. Okay, these are all normal things, but they're dealt with in a way that is very um, open with, with integrity, you yes. know, how communication should be between two people who love each other. Right. So I make a point of writing adventure and sex and heat and drama and emotion but i also make a real point of writing relationships that are really um not easy but but two people who are really determined to be together and work to be together and respect each other and love each other which i think is really important yeah. to illustrate even even in literature and fiction i think yeah. because these are modern stories um they it, it it is honest they are honest relationships yeah. they're possible doable relationships you know warts and all uh -huh. <laughs> but at the end of the day it's two people who really would walk through the fire for each other and yeah. it's hard one a lot of the relationships are definitely worked for right so it, it makes them even sweeter when they when they finally get it together oh i love and it and my books are exclusive to amazon Mm -hmm. So if you if you go onto Amazon and search for my name, all 32, 31, no, 31 of my books, I'm working on the 32nd now. Um, so you can always just go to Amazon and find my books or go to my website, marisoljames.com. And there you can sign up for my newsletter where I give information about what I'm doing and sneak peeks of upcoming books. But if they're just looking for a book to actually read, go straight to Amazon and, and choose one of my six series. I would recommend either the Unseen Enemy series or the Road Devils MC series, because they seem to be the crowd favorites. Given yeah. it, or maybe Dangerous, maybe Dangerous Curves as well. So maybe those three, one of those three, I would suggest. Oh, I love it. I love it. And tell everybody your website, where they can find your website. Yeah, marisoljames.com. Um, you can find, or you can just go to my Instagram, Marisol James, or Facebook, Marisol James, mm -hmm. or, um, oh, I have a YouTube channel now, Marisol James. So kind of plug me into Google and see what comes back. <laughs> <laughs> it'll, it'll spit me out one way or the other. <laughs> oh, I love it. This has been amazing, Marisol. I, I thank you so much for coming on the show today. I thank you so much for doing this episode. I think it's so needed in our society because there are so many narcissists and so many narcissist relationships. And yeah. you've really pointed out a lot of great things. And you've really, you know, I think you're going to give a lot of people a lot of wisdom and strength through this episode. So thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thanks you're for welcome. having me, Stacey. <laughs> oh, you're very welcome. And you have a great day. You too. You too. I'll talk to you soon. <laughs> yes, we're going to talk soon.